Welcome on in golf fans, it's your boy GS Luke here with our course breakdown for this week's US Open. Gonna go through all things Pinehurst number two, make sure you're familiar with the venue for this major, and afterwards talk about some of my key stats and comp courses that I'm using to identify my top plays of the week. So by the end, you'll be an expert on what to expect from the golf course and be able to go out there and get a lot of your research started. So gonna get right to it, just straight to the point, no fluff out here in this video, and start it off with some of the course details for this week. It's been 10 years since we saw this course last in major championship action, and really nothing has changed since the 2014 US Open. Pinehurst number two is an absolute masterpiece of a golf course, and in fact, one of my top three golf courses in all of the United States. So be able to come back here this year and five years from now for what is it, the 2029 US Open is going to be an absolute treat for us golf fans. And the reason why Pinehurst is my favorite course uh, at least with this kind of styling, is because of the green complexes and the lack of rough around this golf course. So just going over here to some of the pictures of Pinehurst, it is really unique and kind of the only golf course that I can think of that compares to it would be something like a Congaree Golf Club, which is just down the road, uh, about an hour and a half south, and has the same kind of bunkering. They've got a lot of wire grass, gorse bushes around this golf course, uh, and you can see no rough out there. So it's fairways, and then you get into the natural areas, and then around the green, it's also a little bit unique. So bringing up this picture over here, you can see that there's no rough around the green either, and everything is either shaved off fairway area or these natural areas slash bunkers. The around the green shots are extremely difficult, and even though that the greens here aren't all that small, they're about 6,500 square foot, which is actually a little bit larger than your tour average, they play probably sub 3,000 square foot because the, maybe the one thing that is the most known, the most infamous about Pinehurst number two is the bowl shaped of the greens. They call them turtle back greens. Uh, there's a few different terms you can use for the styling of green that we have here. But as you can see on some of these overhead views, everything rolls off to the side. I mean, everything. Every single green around Pinehurst number two has the same sort of style. In the middle, there's usually a little bit of a depression on these greens. So if you have pin locations that are inside that bowl, you can access them with pre precise iron shots. However, if you don't hit it to that center of the green, if you end up missing just a few yards to the left or the right, you're gonna end up in one of these chipping hollows with an extremely difficult up and down. With the US Open, they've added even more wire grass bushes out here in the natural areas. So with some of these overhead views, this is of course Pinehurst, um, under a normal week, what we'd normally have for a resort style guest here. Uh, but for this week, there's going to be even more of those little bushes that you see in the background. So this golf course played extremely difficult the last time we saw it. It was three years after the renovation and only three players were able to get it under par. You had Martin Keimer win it at nine under. And then after that, I think it was Ricky Fowler, someone else that got it to one under par. And the entire field outside of those three was either one over par or worse. So if we take a look at the scoring averages from back there in 2014, you'll see that it was at least 2.4 over par in every single round. You can see the scoring average effectively for the week was over three over par. So for a par 70 setup, it was playing to about a par 73. So it would already be one of the more difficult par 72s on tour if this was a par 72. Um, for resort guests, this is a par 72. There are two holes that are converted to par fours from par fives out here for the US Open setup. But even as a par 72, this would be an absolute brute. A lot of that is because of the greens, because of how many shots that you're going to have um, off that tight fairway surface. And somebody like Martin Keimer, by the way, didn't hit a chip the entire week off of that fairway. He was putting from around the green regardless of the situation that he was in. And considering that he won by eight strokes out there, there's a good chance that you see that strategy implemented once again by plenty of other players out there in the field. So Martin Keimer kind of gave players the rule book kind of gave them the blueprint to go out there and take on a Pinehurst number two. It is to hit precise iron shots. It is to be very, very conservative when you're going out there and picking a target. And then if you do miss, which is inevitable because of the green complexes that we have, um, even really good shots are going to miss the green and be in almost impossible spots. Um, when you get into those situations, you use your putter and you try and get up and down. 
A few other things to note, we got Bermuda grass from tip to toe. Of course, the sandy natural areas are the one exception to that rule. In terms of a few other things to point out, we have no rough on here. So you can see the rough is actually labeled as the sandy native areas. So I think that that was a little bit interesting. It was originally a Donald Ross design, but is a lot different after the core Crenshaw redesign. So that happened between 2019 to 2011. That's where they brought in all those natural areas, brought in all uh, the gorse bushes, the wire grass that they have around this golf course and really change it up. So if we were to go over to bet the number, we don't have any stats to go off of. So let's try and just take a look at this course hole by hole and get an idea for what they're going to face out here in 2024. Hole number one gives you a real good idea for what Pinehurst is all about. The tee shot plays a lot thinner than it looks on paper. Uh, the more club you take off the tee, the thinner that fairway gets as well. And like I said over there in the introduction, these areas where the drivers are going to come into play have extra bushes here for the US Open. So there's going to be a little bit of a penalty off the tee some of the areas are cleared out in terms of bunkers like you have over here on the left side but this green complex really makes you think you can miss over here on the right but the beauty of this golf course and really the design here in general is if you miss over here to the right which is wide open it does give you a lot of room to some of your left side pin locations is that everything slopes from right to left. So if you miss over there on the broad side of the green, you're gonna have a very touchy around the green shot. So that's part of the beauty here. You're gonna have guys that miss right that end up missing on this bunker on the left. Hole two is 507 yards. It is one of the most difficult holes around this golf course. Maybe not the most difficult, but it'll be up there in the top five. A lot of that is the sheer length being a 500 plus yard par four, but also the green complex, which is among the most severe on the entire site. Hole three is 387, so a little bit of a scorable look. Uh, for round two in 2014, they did move up this tee box, which gave guys like Adam Scott that were hitting the ball a long way then a chance to go for this green off the tee. Now, I doubt that they're gonna do that for one, maybe two rounds or anything more than that, but even as the positional par four that it normally plays as is a scorable look. A lot of players are going to have something in 15 to 20 feet for a birdie, but it's one of the few holes on the entire property where you can feel confident about saying that. Hole four is maybe the hardest hole that we have here at Pinehurst number two. It is 531 yards. It plays extremely long and it's a very demanding tee shot. And uh, this green complex, because it was formerly a par five, is also extremely demanding, just like hole number two. Hole five is 586. So this used to be a par four. It was lengthened a little bit to be a par five. So this green complex is actually a little bit more uh, simp simplistic, a little bit easier than it should be for a par five. So par four is an absolute brute. Par five is not an easy par five by any means. I mean, it's almost 600 yards long. You have that real tight driving corridor to kind of handle as well. But still, because of the green complex not being as bad as hole four, um, you are going to see some birdies at hole five. Hole well, six is 242, long par three. Uh, good luck trying to hold this green complex with anything off the tee. Hole seven is 422, severe dog leg from left to right. A lot of players will just lay up to the end of the fairway as anything trying to cut off the corner is nearly impossible to hold the short stuff. You've got firm fairways out here because of the sand basing around Pinehurst number two, which means even your bombers that can hoist the ball over some of these bunkers are likely going to be at best left side of the fairway and most likely over there in the natural area which might not be the worst case scenario, right? You can catch a lie out here in these natural areas, but you can also get really unlucky. Hole eight is a par four for the US Open. So it says par five here, but this will be a 500 yard par four. So just keep that in mind when you're looking through these stats. Hole nine is 188 yards. It's your last par three of the front nine. Real difficult green complex as it is extremely narrow. Hole 10 is 621, so they will be doing holes 1 and 10 for the start the first few days. So uh, you will have guys that are starting here on a par 5. So it's 621 yards. It's got a lot of length to it. Um, that's the really only defense here, right? These par 5s are going to be the easier holes on site. Just make sure that you're not hitting it in absolute jail off the tee, and you're going to have something reasonable for your third shot. If not, going for it in 2, right? If you're like a Rory or a Bryson, that sort of player. 11 is 481, longer par 4, uh, another really demanding hole with a long iron around Pinehurst. Hole 12 is 452. This is a pretty straight up par 4, one of the wider fairways that you have on site, but you can't hit driver. If you hit driver, it does narrow up a lot with this outcropping to the left, so you're going to see a lot of people hitting 3-wood or even an iron off the tee. 
13 is 385, another one of the shorter par fours. Uh, you're going to have holes like the shorter par fours, the par fives, to go out there and make birdies on, but there's maybe five holes out of 18 that you can say that about. So 13 certainly is one, though. 14 is 474, uh, one of your longer par fours. Not much that has to be said. You got to execute off the tee, and even if you do, you're left with an extremely difficult second shot. 15 is 200 yards, longer par three. Once again, on paper, like these overhead views don't give you guys the full perspective. You can't see the undulations. You can't see how perched up all these green complexes are. These greens look a lot larger than they actually play. And like I said, because of the drop-offs, they play to about half the size, to about 3,500 square foot. 16 is a converted par four. So this will be um, a par four, not a par five, like it says over here on the right. Um, a long par four and one of the hardest holes on the entire course. 17 is 206 yards, so longer par three. And once again, uh, you can't really get a full um, appreciation for the par threes here with the overhead views, but just a beautiful hole, also extremely difficult. And then finally, 18 is 449. It plays slightly uphill. It's also one of the most picturesque holes in the world, let alone here with American Golf. You've got this bunker to the right that you have to go over and try and carry. If you take driver, you can easily take it out of play. This hole, I believe, is playing a little bit longer than the overhead views would indicate, but still a very tricky finishing hole. And the green complex here at 18 is probably the hardest part about it, right? Ball striking it's like 450 it's a par four it's it's really not all that demanding there especially with 500 plus yard par fours on this golf course but the green complex is where you get that difficulty so i think a fantastic finishing hole is framed fantastically by the clubhouse in the background and uh, a fitting golf course for a major championship like we have this week and now that we've seen the course, let's talk about how I'm identifying my top plays. So first off, going to go through some of the modeling key stats for this golf tournament, and then afterwards going to go through some comps. So first off, in terms of our key stats, the number one thing you want to look at this week is shots gained approach. This is a second shot golf course, if I've ever seen one. It does have some length to it, so I could see the argument for wanting a little bit of a bomber off the tee, but mostly, I mean, we saw a lot of shorter guys show up in 2014, so that's the reason why I'm not just looking at bombers, but it's all about the second shot. Shot. Martin Keimer showed us the blueprint in 2014. It was having an extremely high green and regulation percentage. And then when you miss those greens, just getting up and down with that putter, right? Using that flat stick around the green, getting it close to the hole, converting with those four to five footers for par is how you go out there and win this golf tournament. So guys like Scotty, Corey Connors, Hoagie, that are elite tier iron players are going to get a huge boost in my modeling this week, but this isn't a pure ball striking test. I think that there's a lot more nuance to this golf course, a lot more creativity than I think a lot of people are expecting. And I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, Scotty's a lock to win this week, so on and so forth. And you know, he's the best player in the world. I think he's probably my top model ranking this week as well. I haven't run my model quite yet, but I'm assuming he's probably going to be number one there when I do it here in an hour or so. But at the same time, because of how difficult it is around the green, because of the variance of the wire grass and everything like that, I understand that it's not just about the ball striking. Right? It's a second shot golf course for sure. I would agree with a lot of people when they say that, but there's a lot more to it than just that. And I think it's going to be hard to model this week. What I'm really looking at, I, I'm glad that looking at around the green off the fairway, but hitting shots off of tight lies is not something that everyone's capable of. You see it a lot at the Masters. It's why a lot of people at the Masters have to play there four or five times before they have success. And I think the number one thing that's going to differentiate people this week, ball striking matters. That, that would be my number one key stat. But a close number two is this around the green play. And I, I think over here in Bet the Number, they're doing the right thing, trying to look at the fairway stats over here. But keep in mind that some of these top players, right, are small sample size guys like um, Moldovan, Mansell, Ryder, right? We never see them over here with um, PJ Tor sanctioned stats but if we go down a little bit further you're going to see a lot of guys that you'd expect to see on this list like scotty shuffler winner at the masters multiple times is a really good player off of fairway grass hideki matsuyama masters champion shows up on this list tommy fleetwood's kind of known for that as well and if we go down this list i think that the masters is a much better comp for this golf course than people would expect of course, the Masters, you don't have those waste areas. They don't have the sand, the wire grass, the gorse bushes that you're going to get here with a Pinehurst number two. But what you do get are greens that play a lot smaller than what you're going to get for this week. And also an around the green skill set that is very unique. I mean, you don't see these these kinds of greens really anywhere else in the world. So I think the treat this week, just like every other week, would be a little bit 
of a mistake. So though I like guys like Scotty this week a lot, I like the ball strikers. I think off the tee play in general, uh, it, it's always going to help you, but it's not really what I'm looking at this week. I think there's going to be a lot more of a, a feel to this kind of week. I don't think it's going to be all a stat week out there for us stat nerds like somebody like myself. It feels like you're going to kind of have to just watch golf kind of no ball a little bit this week to know you can hit those tight around the green shots. So if you just take a look at these around the green stats, try and point out a few more players that were kind of sticking out there. Isaac Sunji Im had been good off the surface. Sibu Kim, Ricky Fowler, um, all from the eye test would make sense for that from that perspective. Guys like JT are known for that. Patrick Cantlay, another player that really shines off that short stuff, are all guys that I think get an extra boost. And if you can marry that up with some approach stats, kind of like we have with uh, somebody like a Sibu, you can see Justin Thomas here is doing it on approach. Of course, Scotty Scheffler is the most elite example in that category. These are the players that in my modeling are going to creep towards Towards the top. If you're good off the short stuff, if you're a good iron player, those are my top two key stats by far at this kind of week. A few other stats that they're looking at here and bet the number of these mid irons, there are going to be plenty of mid irons around this golf course. So I think that that's a pretty sharp thing to look at there too. So you can see some of the poppers in that category. You've got Han up there, John Rom, Scotty Scheffler, they're all plus players out there with those mid irons. Also guys like Grayson Sig, Berger, Jake Knapp, Hovland, all plus players there. If we're looking at the longer green and regulation numbers, so this would be for your longer par threes, also for those 500 plus yard par fours. If you're just trying to get on the surface and two putt there and get away, I think that's kind of what um, bet the number is saying here with this kind of number. This is what you can look at. So you got Bryson up there, which makes sense with his length. You've got Terrell Haddon, Patrick Cantley again showing up. So maybe he's a little bit of a sneaky course fit this week. Keegan Bradley, Scotty Shuffler shows up in literally every category. So I don't know how surprised we could be there. And then over here, bet the number, they're looking at driving accuracy. I don't necessarily agree with this as much. Because I think that the off the tee is going to be variant this week. I think it's going to be extremely random. So off the tee, I'm including my modeling. I think driving distance will always help you. But it's de-emphasized for me this week. Whether it's driving distance, whether it's driving accuracy. When you have these natural areas out there, when you have just pure luck, whether you're going to hit it in one of those wire grass plants, whether you're going to hit it in a gorse bush or something like that, I have a hard time when investing a lot into off the tee play when it's going to be so random. And we're going to talk comps here in a second. But a lot of my comps... Are, are the same kind of golf courses where guys that went out there in one at my number one comp course that you're going to see it is not the kind of player that you'd expect to go out there and win at a long, really demanding major championship test. So this is a week where I think the modeling is a little bit random. It's a little bit misleading, if I'm going to be quite honest with you. If Scotty wins this, I'm not going to be surprised. But the other thing I'll throw out there, guys, if we get somebody like a Gary Woodland who wins a major championship... Uh, even like a Justin Rose. I'm talking even Martin Keimer, right? Who won here back here in 2014, who has, he has two majors. A lot of those other guys like Gary Woodland, right? Only have one major. It would not surprise me if we got a winner this week that is a one-time major champion, right? This is the only major that they ever end up getting. Not to say that it's going to be some slappy, that we don't want winning a major championship, but this is the kind of week where somebody goes out there, wins their one major, and then probably never wins one again. Now, if it's Scotty, obviously that's not going to be the case. But if it's a Cantlay that goes out there and wins for the first time and never wins again, I would not be that surprised about it. If it was somebody like a Billy Horschel who wins their first and ever major, I honestly wouldn't be that surprised about by, by that either. I think there are a lot of players that are live to win this event because of first off how difficult it is, right? There was only three guys under par here last time. In second off, the variance off the tee and the around the green skill set. The around the green skill set is unique. I mean, Martin Keimer did not hit a chip the entire week. So if you're somebody that's using your key stats this week, you know, looking at European tour stats, looking at PGA tour stats, live golf stats, right? For those players, you're not doing yourself a good service this week. That's my opinion on it. I'm a huge stat nerd to say that. There's no golf courses that really compare to what we have here. And you're going to see with my comp courses, there's maybe one golf tournament that we've seen so far this year that even somewhat compares to what we're going to get here. It's just a tough one to want to lean into the stats too much. So that is my uh, PSA, my warning when it comes to your custom modeling this week. It just doesn't feel like a really good one for it. All right. And now for some comp courses. And honestly, because my modeling this week is probably going to be a little bit less impactful, these comp courses are going to be where I'm doing a lot of my research. And our 
number one comp course is one that maybe doesn't come to mind for a lot of people. We don't have a huge sample size from this golf course, which is kind of what I was saying, where like it's hard to trust any stats for this event because we haven't even seen courses that compare to what we're going to get here at Pinehurst. But I think the best comp really ever for this golf course, I, I think almost... I almost see an identical like carbon copy of the golf course, but there are a lot of things going on at the Ocean Course at Kiowa to what we have this week. Ocean Course at Kiowa, if you guys aren't familiar, maybe you weren't watching golf or as invested in it back there in 2021, um, but that's when Phil won, when he was over 50 years old, um, oldest major champion uh, since, I don't know, 1950s or something like that out there on the PGA Tour. But par 72, so not the par 70 that we have this week, but an absolutely brutally long golf course, nearly 7,900 yards, and it has a lot of those natural sandscapes to it. It's a coastal golf course, so not a coastal course at all this week, right, over there in Pinehurst, but it has a lot of that sand going to it. It has a lot of those natural wiregrass plants over there on that coastal lynx land. In the greens, though they're not perfectly identical, had that same thing going on. I don't know whether, and obviously Pete Dye, completely different designer than somebody like Donald Ross, completely different redesigner than somebody like Corin Crenshaw, who did the renovation here at Pinehurst number two. But at Kiba Island, Pete Dye has all these really perched up greens, which first off makes the wind just howl over them. Because it's a coastal course, the wind would just howl over those surfaces at Kiowa. And when you missed, everything would roll off on the fairway areas. There wasn't that much rough around the golf course. A few holes where you did have rough around the green. So it's not a perfect comp here. But there's no other courses where you really had that natural area. You had a few other major championships uh, that kind of compared. Um, the one where Jordan Spieth won. I forget the name of the course now. Out there out west in the north uh, west of the United States. Went out there, won in a similar type of track with a lot of natural areas. There's not that much that we have to compare to. And what I think at Kiowa that makes this especially interesting is that you had a lot of long iron shots. It's a 7,900 yard golf course. So as you'd expect, a lot of the shots are required. And at this golf course, it's about hitting those greens with those 200 plus yard approach shots. So it's got the length aspect. It's got the look off the tee. It's got the feel off the tee. And interestingly enough, let's look at who played well that year. Not a lot of bombers off the tee. And that's crazy for a 7,900 yard golf course. I mean, look at this. There's no bombers up here other than Brooks. Guys like Phil are not a bomber by any means at this stage of his career. Um, interesting that he won at this kind of golf course. And, of course, he's looking for his grand slam out there with the U.S. Open. If he's going to get it done, this is the one course I think that he might be able to do with that. So I'm not going to bet on this week. I, I might play him in some DFS lineups, but that is interesting that he won at my number one comp course. But Louis Ustays and Brooks were up there. Shane Lowry finished in fourth. What we don't have are, oh, where's Rory? Oh, Scotty Shuffler, I know, 20. 21. So Scotty wasn't quite Scotty at that point. But even guys like John Rahm down there, right? Scotty finished in T8 at this event back there in 2021. They weren't the guys finishing in the top five. And just like Pinehurst in 2014, hardly anyone broke par at this major championship. So I think there are a lot of comparisons that can be made. It was a lot windier at the ocean course that week than what we're going to get over there at Pinehurst a little bit inland, but enough comparisons that I think you can look at it. Next, we're going to go to 2023, and we're going to go to the CJ Cup in South Carolina. So I mentioned Congaree a little bit earlier, but just a little bit down the road, a lot of similar things going on there too. It's a par 71, but it is nearly a 7,800-yard golf course. So we don't have the yardage on here, but I can tell you it is an extremely long and difficult golf course, and it's got the same kind of bunkering going on. Not a ton of rough. Now, you do have technical rough at this golf course down here at Congaree, but it's very short rough. It's not very substantial. It's a a lot of bunkering, a lot of deep bunkering that you have um, over there at Congaree, but also greens that are all perched up. They're all way higher than the rest of the land, and you have a, just real difficult around the green shots. When you miss greens there, it would roll off like 15 to 20 feet. It was sand capped, so sand capped, same kind of soil that you have here at Pinehurst. And same part of the country as well. So again, not a huge sample size. We played the CJ Cup there. Year before that, it was the Palmetto Championship. They played at Congaree. So there's two years of data to work with. But look at this. Rory finished in first. Um, you have more bombers showing up at this event, which you'd expect with one of these longer golf courses. But just more leaderboard crossover that we can look at. And to give you guys an idea, a lot of around the green players that were showing up here too. Like, for example, Tommy Fleetwood, that was really good off that short grass. Rory, Rory McIlroy is a really good around the green player. John Rahm was showing up on that short grass. Billy Horschel, right? I mentioned maybe this is where he gets his first and, and only major championship. 
it, th these are the kind of comp courses that I'm looking at. And then the last comp course is a little bit more straightforward, is uh, the Masters. It's the, the first major of the year, Augusta National. I mentioned that a lot of the greens play smaller there. A lot of the around the green shots are similar. Um, there are plenty of differences. Most off the rough, right? This is more of a traditional style of golf course. I'd say the greens maybe even a little bit more difficult at the Masters than what we're going to get at Pinehurst. But a lot of the guys that have had success at this creative style of golf course, I think are going to translate really well over here to this U.S. Open. So it's very different than most U.S. Opens, right? Usually we're looking for guys that are going out there, good at hacking it out of rough, real long off the tee, uh, all about that tee to green play. Not so much this time. It's a lot more about that creativity. Um, long iron play would certainly be nice to add on top of it. But what you've seen with these comp courses, it's more about the agronomy, more about the feel of the golf course than it is about a certain key stat metric that we're looking at. So again, I think it's a week where the modeling might be, it's always a little bit helpful, but a little bit less helpful for this kind of golf tournament just because of the style of play that we're going to see out there. Alrighty, guys, that is all I've got for the course breakdown this week. Before you're hopping out of here, go ahead, smash a like button for me, and also comment down below what you've got as the winning score for this week. If you go ahead and get that right, you'll win a free month on my Patreon page, which is, of course, where I'm posting all of my projections for DFS out there, my outright betting card. I've got a prop tier over there where I'm posting all my props for underdog and prize picks for any given event. So make sure to go ahead, give me your guess down below to enter to win a free month of that. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a solid week out there at the U.S. Open. So best of luck with all your exposure, whether it's for props or over there for DFS. We will have plenty of content dropping throughout the week. So also make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So don't miss any of that when it goes out there and drops. We've got a course breakdown already out, which you just watched, but a DFS embedding preview drop in a little bit later on this evening. Tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be trying to put out a prop preview. Part of that is dependent on when they drop the boards, but it's a major championship week. I'm expecting those to drop a little bit earlier. And then weekly, our weekly live stream Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, where you can bring any questions that you have for DFS betting for this week and uh, go out there and get those answered before lock. So looking forward to it. A lot to come, guys. Best of luck with all of your exposure. Smash the like button if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys for the content throughout the rest of the week.